So I want to welcome everyone today um, to, to um, hear Holyance's experiences, Holyance Odiambo, our presenter today. Just a little background on, on Holyance. Holyance says about himself that he served in the Office of External Affairs of the Baha'is of Kenya as a coordinator since 2019. Um, his office explores the discourse themes on the environment and climate change, peace and national cohesion, sustainable development, and gender equality. Previously, he worked for the World Agroforestry Center, one of uh, CGIAR's centers that conducts research on agroforestry and livelihoods. It is while promoting sustainable land husbandry that he developed a keener interest in smallholder farming. He has a bachelor degree uh, on, of environmental science from Kenyatta University, Nairobi, Kenya, and is also a farmer. Uh, together with his family, they cultivate crops, raise livestock for home consumption, and awful, often sell, sell surplus products. So welcome, welcome, Holyans. Thank you. Uh, so much Adon. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening to people who are in uh, in the African content, uh, continent. Um, uh, Oliens, you could you could turn on your video now if you'd like for yourself. Okay, okay let me. So we can see you, see you speaking. That'd be great. Yeah, I I I. Used Turn it on, uh, off, maybe just to ensure that um, it's not yeah. lagging. We'll see. We'll see how it works. Okay. Let me... We'll start off like this, and then if if we have problems, you can you can turn it off. That's great. Okay. So you're able to see it clearly. Yes. Perfect. Oh, okay. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so today um, I'm going just to make a brief statement about some of the policies that our government has um, has had uh, for the last two decades uh, in effort to transform um, agriculture and also to ensure that uh, a lot more youths um, get involved in crop cultivation and also in the value chains so that we are able to be food secure and also to continue being uh, productive. So, um, so. It, uh -huh. So, um, so welcome to Kenya. So, uh, right now, uh, as the end of last year, we are approximately fifty-three million uh, Kenyans, and majority of that are people between the age group from zero to thirty-five years. So, between fifteen and thirty-five. 35% of the population and children all make the other, the other large portion. So we are quite a youthful country. And however, that comes with its challenges, uh, especially amongst the young people. Uh, the youth unemployment is up to 35 years, 35% uh, of, of the unemployed. Uh, and if you compare that to national average, which is 10%, it's quite high amongst the young people. And um, agriculture has always been uh, identified as one of the uh, areas that can possibly um, create jobs that uh, young people take up. Um, right now, Kenya has two levels of governments. Uh, so we have the national government, then we have 47 devolved units. And um, this 
Uh, these two levels of government are quite distinct, but they are very interdependent uh, because a lot of resources come from the national government to the devol devolved units, which are 47 in number. And um, there are also uh, separate functions that has been uh, highlighted uh, in our constitution. Um, up to last year, uh, the country's GDP was at about 110 billion US dollars. And um, so when you check on your on the right side of the, uh, you'll see the neighboring countries. So uh, we, we border Uganda, Tanzania, and Ethiopia to the north, and Somalia to, to the north, uh, to the east. Um, we are quite similar to some of the, our neighbors, but sometimes there are also very diverse cultural differences uh, with, our, with some of our neighbors. So, how does agriculture look like in Kenya? Number one, it plays a very significant role uh, because um, it contributes almost 25% of the GDP. Uh, that's the directly and then up to 27% um, in the uh, interlinked um, sectors. So, that's how much important agriculture is. Um, most of the uh, agricultural uh, setup uh, or production happens on small scale. And uh, when I mean small scale is the size of uh, the production unit of land, which is between 0.2 to uh, 3 hect hectares. And this makes up up to 75% of agricultural production. Actually, um, some of the major exports like tea, 50% uh, of the tea ex uh, production come from the small, uh, small scale uh, producers. 65% uh, of coffee also come from uh, small scale producers. So they make majority of the production and they're quite important. And despite the fact that we are a very youthful country, the average age of farmers is more than 60 years. And that's always been the reason why everyone is concerned. And that's why we, are, we haven't been so much responsive to some of the emerging challenges that are now facing agricultural production because um, the capacity of the, the current farmers to, to readjust is quite limited. Uh, we also uh, depend heavily on rainfall uh, for production. Actually, uh, less than 15% of the production uh, is under irrigation and the major crops that um, is produced in the country. So the major, major crops are maize, rice, uh, wheat and uh, potatoes and vegetables. Industrial co crops include um, tea, coffee, sugarcane, cotton, sunflower. However, right now the most, uh, econo the most uh, important ones are just tea and coffee. Uh, sugar cane and cotton industry uh, are struggling for, and there have been struggles for some time since around the 90s. So what are some of the challenges that keep the youths away from getting engaged in agriculture? Uh, one of the major uh, challenge is the perception of agricultural activities. So for a very long time, agriculture and production of crop has been perceived as, um, as work for, for the elderly and also for the illiterate. Um, and for youths who have no any other options, 
probably they are semi-literate or uh, uh, they, they have no interest of moving away from, from the rural community. There are other, uh, there are other factors which have, always, which have also contributed to this negative persuasion. Um, for example, agriculture, uh, especially in rural uh, areas, certain chores in agriculture has always been used as a form of punishment. So with that in mind, you'll find not so many young people would be attracted to, to, to go into agriculture when they are able to make independent choices. Another, uh, another factor is access to land for agribusiness. Often here, land is hereditary and um, young people would only be able to access land with permission from their parents. However, not so many parents trust the young people with their land and the decisions are often is not in the favor of young people. So even the ones who are interested in, in, in venturing in agriculture, sometimes they have a challenge to access land. Another challenge that's always been there uh, is the impact of climate change. Considering that uh, most of our production is rain fed, we find that the production is very vulnerable to changes uh, in weather patterns. So whenever there is extreme weather events, so like drought, for example, we've been experiencing a drought. In some region, it's now been more than one and a half years that they've not had rains. And even if you've seen on news lately, uh, a lot of uh, pastoralist communities are losing their livestock. And insurance, um, crop insurance and livestock insurance, um, these are just some of the products which are now are being uh, tested. So it's, yeah, it's the, the, that kind of insurance is not very common in this country. Uh, there's also low levels of value addition. Often most of the agricultural produce are sold in their raw form and they are not processed. This uh, makes the, the income from the products quite low. And so it's, it's a, it discourages young people to venture into the business when the margins of profits are quite low. The inadequate access to finance is also a major challenge. And this is because of two major factors. Uh, Often times, the young people don't have the collateral that can be used to, to access um, credit facilities from financial uh, institutions. And also they haven't, uh, they don't have enough uh, savings that, they can, that can be used or they don't have uh, records of savings that uh, often the financial institutions seek for when they want to determine who is credit worthy. Another challenge uh, is also skills uh, necessary for production. Yeah, so most of the young people in this country are literate, yes, but they do not have uh, agronomic skills or they would not have um, the production level skills that would be used in, a, in value addition of the products of agricultural producers. Um, uh, some of us, them also don't have business skills. So this is a big challenge. So often uh, most of the young people venture into um, the businesses often have fail high level of failures. So 
these are some of the uh, issues that for some time now um the government has continuously uh set out to address so this is just a sketch of some of the agricultural strategies uh, that we've had uh, in the country since the year uh, 2004, actually since uh, 2003. And um, uh, I could be curious why it's since 2003. A lot before then, we were, before 2003, we had um, a regime which had been there for over two, for 24 years. And during that um, regime, that during the era that a lot of agricultural production um, started going downwards because of the uh, policies and uh, strategies that had been previously adopted. So let me just run through some of the major uh, strategies and policies that had been introduced since uh, 20 years. So <clears throat> the first one was um, economic recovery strategy, and it was for wealth creation. And uh, this strategic uh, plan was developed by the NAC government, which came in uh, from after the previous government had been in power for 24 years, it was it was quite a tyrannic government, and um, most uh, sectors of the economy were, were collapsing. So, the main deviation from on this economic recovery strategy uh, was that it focused on economic growth and the wealth creation, um, other than what was there before, the, the previous regime was focusing on poverty reduction and not so much on wealth creation. So, <clears throat> so this one um, identify agriculture as one of the uh, leading uh, sector that could spur the growth of the, of the economy of Kenya after mismanagement for, for quite some time. And it set out to revive several agricultural institutions um, in the country. And this included uh, financial institutions, uh, research, agricultural research institutions. It included um, uh, production uh, companies. And um, due to this, uh, economic recovery strategy, uh, it created um, another uh, strategy that was called strategy for revitalizing agriculture. And this was running between the year 2004 and the year 2008. And so with, with it, uh, it reviewed a lot of uh, regulatory frameworks which were there. And um, it set out to restructure a number of government parastatals which were involved in agriculture. And so a number of uh, government parastatals, especially in, in sugar uh, subsector, were, were put out for private, privatization. Um, tea sector was also under review and a lot of things were, were being changed. It, it also set out to improve delivery of extension and advisory services. So there were, there were, previously there were government extension officers which were, were in district offices and the the extension of officers would go around to talk to farmers and advise them on what to grow and some of the good agricultural practices but this was independent and it collapsed at some point so 
there were hardly any um, extension services which were there. So then the government set out um, extension services on demand. So more extension officers were posted uh, to respective uh, district headquarters. So whenever farmers or, or wanted extension services, then they would they would seek them at the at the district headquarters. Another thing that also improved during this period was access to quality inputs and services. So particularly there was improvement in access to fertilizers and seeds because one of the parastatals that was um, one of the parastatals that, that the government invested um, heavily was uh, the Kenyan Seed Company, which uh, produces um, improved varieties and selling it out to farmers. And it expanded to all the major ag agroecological um, zones. It also improved uh, domestic um, and uh, external markets, especially within the East Africa region. So they reviewed uh, policies that uh, govern exports and imports of agricultural uh, produce across the border. So some of the tariffs uh, which were barrier to exportation to the neighbor, neighboring countries were removed. And uh, so this is uh, production. So for example, previously there were tariffs barring uh, export of coffee to our neighboring countries like Uganda. So those ones were, were removed. Then uh, it also formulated food security policies and programs because um, food security is one of the major challenges that we are still struggling with up to date. And um, the programs which were initiated were created in order to ensure that the agricultural uh, areas are food secure and the farmers are able to Sorry. So, so there were security policies and programs which were initiated by the government, and this was geared to ensure that the farming community are food sufficient and to reduce food insecurity, especially amongst communities where they were growing cash crops or commercial crops. So after that uh, period, um, there was a need to to have a long-term development pl uh, plan that would still ensure that the country continues on a, on a growth uh, path. And Vision 2030 was created and it was launched in the year 2008. So it was now a long-term uh, blueprint for the country and it, it was taking over from the economic recovery strategy that uh, I'd earlier mentioned. This uh, vision has three pillars. It has economic pillar, social pillar, and political pillar. So agriculture is one of the key sectors that is under the economic pillar. And uh, <coughs> so, uh, the thing that um, the Vision 2030 <clears throat> set to, to do was to continue reforming agricultural institutions. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> 
there were, there, there were uh, still a number of agricultural institutions that needed to be reformed. And uh, this one so, uh, was also highlighted in this um, in the vision 2030. And it's also set out to increase productivity of livestock and uh, crops. It was also supposed to help improve the move from uh, rain-fed agriculture to irrigation and um, also to improve access through smallholder supply chain management. So during uh, this period or uh, during this period, another another strategy was brought into place, and uh, this was called agricultural sector development strategy. This was a ten-year strategy that was informed by the by the launch of the Vision 2030, which anchored agriculture as one of the major, major sector that needed to grow. And uh, from this point, it had become clear that the economy had recovered to a certain level and it needed to be spurred to start growing uh, to more profitable uh, standards. And so some of the goals that it was seeking was the reduction of unemployment and poverty and also food insecurity. It was also supposed to increase commercialization and competitiveness of agricultural uh, commodities and enterprises. And it was supposed to formulate implementing policies and legal frameworks. So during uh, this period, um, we were also strengthening uh, research and extension institutions of the, of the government and also to improve land use and crop development. So well, one of the major uh, changes that came about was uh, streamlining of all the major agricultural research institutions. So previously we had um, different agricultural research institutions for various products. And uh, so we had um, tea, develop, tea uh, sugar research institute, we had uh, coffee research, we had tea research. Uh, we, are, we all had different uh, research organization and still there was uh, Kenya Agricultural Research Institute. So during this time, all these research institutes were merged to form Kenya Agricultural uh, Research Organization. And now this incorporated both research in livestock and crops and all those other small uh, research institutes which were there were, were, were merged into, into one and they became directorates within one major organization. This uh, car cut quite um, duplication and saved a lot of cost and it helped in strengthening um, the agricultural organization and improved uh, extension services and uh, even the products uh, that now um, the farmers uh, could access from them. And uh, Other thing that also happened 
uh, we had the agricultural um, development corporation. So agricultural development corporation, um, it's the one which uh, uh, major uh, commercial uh, people. So agricultural development corporation was supposed to help uh, uh, corporations access finance and also advice on how streamline some of the parastatals which were also in the agricultural uh, sector. Then uh, from there, the government also sought to, to become more of regulators and facilitators uh, in the agricultural sector rather than uh, being uh, involved in the agricultural production uh, in itself. So further, um, more parastatals which were being controlled by the government between line of production, a number of them was sold to, uh, to private corporations. So to help improve their, their management and also to keep on creating employment for, for young people. However, it's during this time that um, we had a constitutional change. So for some time, Kenyans wanted uh, to move to ensure that for uh, to ensure political uh, stability and the, the constitution uh, which was there was quite weak and that's why one regime had been there for 20, 24 years. So there's a new constitution which was passed in the year 2010 and it created the two levels of government that uh, I mentioned earlier. So we had the national government and the national government would be the equivalent of the federal government. Then we had 47 county government. So this is equivalent to the states. And um, not only did it create uh, these two level of government, but it also devolved agricultural functions to the county governments. And uh, so some of the, uh, the roles which were devolved uh, were crop and livestock husbandry, livestock sales yard, then we have the slaughterhouses, there's plant and animal disease controls and management of the fisheries. So basically the county governments uh, needed to, to take care of the production side while the national government was left with um, with formulation of agricultural policies. This uh, was seen as uh, going to ensure that the, the farmers uh, got the services that they required and it ensured that um, every, every area of, or agricultural eco ecological zone was best suited and got uh, localized or customized um, services that they required. However, what was not anticipated was how this was going to, to work uh, between, or oh, how the resources was, were going to be shared between the county governments and the national government because most of financial resources come from the national government, which, which runs the treasury. So often the counties could not be able to provide services to, uh, to the farmers within, within the jurisdiction because the financial allocations that they, they had could not be shared amongst other, other functions that they had to be able to have enough to invest in agriculture. So this necess uh, created a necessity to create a joint agricultural sector consultation and uh, coordination mechanism. And so the joint agricultural sector consultation coordination mechanism um, ensured that 
there was um, effective collaboration between the national government and the county governments in discharging their duties. And after that, uh, one of the main um, strategy that came out of uh, the, the agric joint agricultural consultation mechanism is the agricultural sector transformation and growth strategy for 2019 to 2020, 2029. It is moving from the previous uh, it's building on the successes from the previous uh, strategies that have been there. And now it, it's building on evidence-based approach that focuses on deliveries at the county level. It's also uh, set out to address the effect of climate change and just to address agricultural output uh, constraints which are there and also improve uh, productivity and natural resource management. Uh, it's also uh, supposed to increase small scale farmer and pastoralist uh, and fisher fox incomes. And also supposed to increase uh, household level food resilience. So the, the main, the main um, focus now with, with, the, with the current strategy is to ensure that a lot more a lot more people get involved in, ag in, in agriculture and to provide data that can be used to influence the decisions that are made and also to see how resources are going to be effectively allocated across all the agricultural uh, all the all the counties in the country and it is one of the main uh, it's it's one of the, the policies that it has set out is to address the issues of engaging young people more in, uh, in agricultural production, because that has been a challenge that even with the previous uh, policies and strategies which have been there, the involvement of young people in agriculture still has been quite low. Uh, and this has also set out to increase investment in mechanization of farming and uh, investment in technology. So what are some of the uh, major achievements of these uh, strategies and policies which have been there? One main uh, achievement has been uh, to improve, uh, has been improvement in uh, ICT infrastructure, uh, technologies and innovation. So for example, uh, the Kenya Agricultural uh, and Livestock Research Organization right now has invested so much uh, in mobile applications, which provide agricultural extension uh, services to the farmers. So when you when you go onto their portal, um, you can find so many uh, different uh, extension products that has already been customized uh, to to reach uh, farmers on their on their mobile phone. Uh, that one has also increased uh, investment in educational progress uh, processes by the non-state actors. 
for example, uh, one of the uh, major financial institutions in this country for, for the last three, uh, three years have, uh, has been investing through their foundation. Um, they've been supporting 3,000 uh, young people every year who get uh, training, short uh, training um, on agricultural production. Like you see here, uh, these ones who are some of the beneficiaries of the KCB to Giajiri Foundation, which was uh, teaching young people within urban areas to, to farm. Or, this is hydronic. This is uh, hydroponics farming, yes. So the young people are being taught on hydroponics farming, especially within major uh, urban areas. So you see that one there. And um, the counties, the county governments have also uh, started the processes of uh, establishing centers where produces can always be, be sold from. And they have also started setting up uh, value addition of centers within, within the, the, the counties. So most of the products get to, to the market as fast as possible because the county governments are now investing in the aggregation points. And from the aggregation points, it's, it's a lot easier for them to get to the market. And there's also been the, the investment in the agricultural uh, research institutions. So these are both for the government institutions and also uh, non-state in institutions. There have been a lot more um, support which is coming also from, from outside. And uh, amongst the young people, they've also been improving interest in agricultural production and value chain. And this is, uh, this is, also this is happening as a result of now easy access to information. So like um, some, some of the applications that can easily, uh, that the, most people can now access include uh, disease diagnostic applications. So one has been developed by, by an organization and the app is called Nuru app. So cassava farmers can just use that to diagnose uh, cassava uh, diseases and even pests. And uh, so for Calro, they have a number of applications, mobile applications that people access. And especially the most people who have embraced this are young people who now get the services at their farm on their, uh, on their farms. Uh, one other thing which have also improved is uh, provision of information about uh, rainfall patterns and uh, weather events that are important to the producers. So these are all information which based on, on location, a farmer is able to access um, weather prediction, weekly weather prediction, and also seasonal weather prediction, which is as long as three months. Um, so are there rooms for improvement? And what are some of the experiences that, as, uh, that can uh, shed some light from the Baha'i experience in soci social and uh, economic uh, activities. One of the main challenge that happens with all these uh, developments that we have in the country is that the target uh, 
population that these policies are made for sometimes are not even aware of their existence and what they are set to benefit from. This is because of the way the stakeholders who are engaged in creating them don't consult so much to the, to the local levels. So I think uh, one, one area that needs improvement is the consultation process that would improve how people know about these uh, policies and how people need to, are going to benefit from them. Another thing is um, building on existing substructures within the communities. Oftentimes, most of these uh, policies and strategies have led to creation of, of new structures. And this has been quite difficult uh, for people to understand. And because of administrative reason, sometimes the structures are not as close to the people uh, as possible. Then um, there's also huge financial uh, demand from this uh, for, uh, that are required to ensure that some of these strategies are implemented fully. So, and the way the resources are limited, uh, the government. So, some of the best way that the resources would be raised is also to ensure that resources are raised from uh, the beneficiaries and the, uh, and, the, and, the, and the target community. For example, I know in Western Kenya, where we've had, in a cluster where we've had um, social action activity for some time, they managed uh, to create a local financial institution where the people, the members are able to get credit and financial uh, services from the institution based on their, their social capital. So because I know you, I can vouch for you or I can recommend you. And so the, they've managed to use it to save um, money whenever they make sales. So it's more of a community bank where the, the community bank has certain amount of money, but it's all spread uh, to various members within that community to, to be able to, to borrow from the, the bank and also save within the bank. Another thing that really needs improvement is the environmental, uh, the aspect of environmental stewardship. Oftentimes, some of these uh, plans and the way they get implemented create dichotomies, it creates distinction between us as people of this country and then there's nature. And nature is there to be exploited. So this has also led to reduction in some of the production capacities we have in the country. Then there's also issues of integrity. So learning from our experience, I believe one of the most, um, thing, uh, the most important thing also is to ensure that the people uh, who implement the, pro, uh, the projects um, are very, uh, have very high standard of integrity and they, are, and they are honest with the people and they implement the, product, uh, the, the projects for the benefit of the farmers and also to ensure that whenever this consultation it's done in a way that all the people feel 
engage and all their views feel respected. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for being uh, good listeners. So any questions? I have a question. I, I see that the name of the organization is now the Kenya Agricultural and Livestock uh, Organization. Is that right? So I was just wondering, you gave statistics for um, the crops. Do you, have, do you have statistics? It would be interesting to have statistics on like poultry and cattle and sheep and that kind of thing. Goats. Oh, so you, uh, you interested in, in uh, statistics on on livestock? Uh, um, I, I don't know how I'm going to get the statistics. So uh, we are also as a country we we. Huge, uh, huge part of the country is semi-arid, so there's a lot of uh, production and major livestock are just cattle, goats, and sheep. And this is also make quite a co contribution to the, to the agricultural sector. Um, let me see this statistic. I'll, I'll I'll share that with you uh, 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 later. I, I can't yeah. can't get it now. That's okay. Thank you. So if you have, there are some questions in the chat, right? Uh, I was just going to say that if you have a if you have a question or a comment, if you could raise your hand, that way we can recognize you. Um, yes, there are there are a couple of questions here in the chat. Um, Mark Griffin asks, is mechanized commercial farming competing with small scale farms? Often uh, mechanized uh, commercial farming uh, does not compete with a small scale farm. Um, because uh, one is because of the the, um, the land tenure system that we have in this country. So in, in the, the specific areas where only small scale farming is viable, unless someone is quite wealthy that you would buy huge chunks of huge tracts of land. However, land also being hereditary, it's often very difficult to buy out um, large tracts of land in certain sections. So, Probably where you define commercial uh, large scale farming is where um, the colonialist had set out as uh, uh, plantation farms. So there you can get up to 50,000 hectares of land for, for commercial uh, farming. And also in very arid areas where uh, people are largely pastoralist, they still have large tracts of land. So depending on, uh, especially where there are ranches, you can get leases for you know, that kind of farming. Right. So there's also, um, also one more question in the chat, also from Mark. Um, UNEP is based in Kenya. Does UNEP support agriculture there or FAO? Does the UN do much or is it all up to the Kenyan government? Often uh, United Nations Environment Program uh, is not involved so much in, in agriculture, but FAO does um, get involved in, uh, in helping the government come up with some of these strategies. So they invest on them. I've also like uh, for some time now, I've also seen 
FAO funded projects within the country. So uh, not long ago, I was talking to someone who uh, was telling me about a project that is beginning. It's a, it's a collaboration between World Food Program, FAO, and Cereal Growers Association of Kenya that is uh, it's called uh, Farms to Market. It's a value chain for a number of cereal crops. So it's a new project that's just about to begin. So yes, FAO does support agricultural projects. Thank you. Winnie. Apologies, because right at that last slide, which I was so interested in uh, about, is there consultation that might lead to farmers associations and so on having their voice, uh, I got an important family call. So if I'm repeating some things, uh, just skip the, the question. But there's two things I'm thinking of. One is um, the war in Ukraine and how it affects the folks in Kenya as far as food security. And do they get uh, more of a world view now of how they, they, we're all connected because on the USA news that I watch, and I watch a wide variety of the news, it seems that Africa is holding back on um, endorsing helping uh, Ukraine. And then um, uh, Zelensky, the head of Ukraine, is talking about coming to Africa to try to help the cause. So I'm interested in that. Does it, does it bring the people into more of a worldview? Because here in the United States, it's a, a some of some and some of the other. The other thing that I noticed was so many of the things that you mentioned are true here as well of the, the difficulties. And I see that Stephen has his hand up. I was wondering, how Kenya um, compares with South Africa in the challenges and advances that you have mentioned. So that was my two uh, issues. Okay, so uh, one thing uh, that I didn't maybe mention clearly, uh, some of the challenges that uh, we've had in implementing some of the strategies or some of the factors that affect their success is external factors, which is international policies and global trade. So the war in Ukraine has affected us as a country, has affected food security, um, because for some reason, um, our wheat production went down and we were depending on so much wheat import from Ukraine and Russia. And uh, we also importing fertilizers from Russia. Then we were also importing cooking oil from Ukraine. So when the war began and you know the shipping lines were disrupted, the prices of these commodities went up. And actually last year we had low uh, production because the, when the, the war just, be, the war began just before, uh, before the season started and we could not get fertilizers from there. So our production was affected. So it does affect us. And uh, when the war began, I remember um, Kenya, Kenya made, one of the government officials uh, made a statement uh, that um, we, was, uh, we, we were going to, to, to stand with uh, Ukraine. However, at some point, I think it was within in a few hours later, uh, he was for he was made to apologize, maybe from the state house because um, we equally have uh, a good diplomatic relationship with with Russia, so it becomes complicated. Uh, 
to, to take a stand, but considering the atrocities that's happening there and um, uh, majority of, of Kenyans empathize with uh, the Ukrainians. And if we, if we were made to choose, I believe they would wish to support Ukraine. However, because of you know trade reasons and ties, it becomes catch-22. So, but Kenya is an open country. So if Zelensky were to come to Africa, probably one of the stops would be, would be Kenya. Then, uh, then you also asked about similarity with, uh, with South Africa. Uh, with there, there are certain similarities we, uh, with South Africa, uh, but not so much. Because um, South African production is quite highly uh, mechanized, and um, they also they they do produce so much that um, we have a lot of imports also from South Africa. South Africa we get imports for some horticulture like apples. We we import from South Africa. Um, we also we import um i think wheat also comes some wheat also comes from south africa because uh our, our, our production here nowadays is not just enough and we suffer so we suffer so many frequent droughts that most people have have often choose not to grow wheat because it it takes longer and um so that's that's that that is a major distinction between Kenya and South Africa. Thank you. All right, thank you, um, Stephen. Yes, thank you. Um, it's very interesting to to listen to this. Um, of course, I'm I am in that <laughs> that other country in South Africa. And um, I, I would say that that's a huge dissimilarities because we have a, a long history of division of an agriculture based on race and culture. So um, uh, it's very difficult to compare because uh, as you pointed out, it's, we have highly mechanized, but we also have very highly unmechanized, uh, just depending on which part of the country you're looking at. Um, and we have a long history of, of poverty based based in ethnicity and race um, with policies to, to sustain that. And the, the, the current government really isn't doing much to undo any of that because the power base is still with the small percentage of wealthy, no matter what color they are now. But um, I was interested um, because one of the challenges that we've had here in terms of why we're stuck where we are stuck um, and I was looking at your last slide as well in terms from the Baha'i perspective. I was wondering to what extent do Kenyan policies actually put practice to, to starting with the farmer as opposed to starting with the farm? And I say that because my experience here in South Africa and the work I've done a little bit in Uganda, Kenya, Botswana, and a couple other places, my experience has been that we are concerned about production. Uh, not about the farmers. And so the policy is designed around how much can this land produce? What's the best way to produce it? Uh, and therefore, who's best in the position to produce it now? Which often means sidelining farmers uh, for the sake of production. So I was interested to see, you did not include any statement that said, you know, start with the farmer, which is like our our mantra in, in, in my agricultural uh, discourse. Um, and I, this is something I've been working on for about 40 years now here, just to get policy to recognize that if you don't start with the farmer, you're going to end up exactly where you were before, but perhaps with different people, but still in the same problem. So we've been throwing technology at farmers or at, at farms um, for 60, 70 years now. 
And, you know, the joke that I have with my classes when I was still teaching at university was, you know, 60 years ago, we were poor and black and 60 years later, we're still poor and black, you know, <laughs> and, and nothing has actually changed because um, we haven't actually done what God said, which was start with the farmer. Um, and, and so most of our agricultural planning is around the capacity of the land. Um, and so when you, when you want to solve the problem of youth, we start with land. When you want to solve the problem of food security, we start with land. You know, if you, you pick, a, pick a subject in agriculture, we start with land and production. And even many of the documents that we put out in the Baha'i community, supposed, we look at the projects, we talk about gardens and we talk about food and production, but there's not a lot of discussion around how we're building capacity of farmers. Uh, and 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 the the qualities that that they need to have and the connections they need to have and things like that. So I was just wondering to what extent your policies do that because ours we have we, I'm on a committee right now that's rewriting extension qualifications, and the the it's been the six months of tug of war with with the government who's invested in land based agriculture extension. And the, those of us who've worked in the field are saying, yeah, but you got to train the farmer. You got to work with the farmer. The land will sort itself out once you have a farmer on it that can do something with it. And they just, they struggle so much to see that. So I was, was wondering to what extent Kenya has, uh, has, uh, has managed to um, live up to this standard of the farmer, start with the farmer. Because until we do that, none of these policies, my view, none of these policies are going to work. I believe we are quite similar in that aspect. The policy starts with the with the land and not the farmer. So it's it's a challenge that uh, we haven't yet figured out. And when when the policies are made, especially in this country, uh, it's so much about um, how do I say? Uh, yeah, just throwing in technology and inputs um, to the farmers and expecting that they will be able to adapt to them. And it has, it has not happened uh, that it has not always worked. And that aspect, uh, now, now that you've mentioned it, it's now just ringing into my mind that yeah, some of the the failures we've been having is because we don't put farmers at the forefront. Farmers becomes the last of the stakeholders who get involved. <laughs> Actually, they get involved when you know when people are now talking about the the policy, like this is a draft policy. So you, you have a few stakeholder participation gathering that's uh, called upon and yeah, they say, okay, you participated and that's it. And it's true that if we don't start with, if we don't get the right formula of educating farmers and bringing in values that could ensure sustainability in production that we'll be sitting here and talking about the same challenges the next many years to come. Yeah, and I would just like to, to, to add that the same thing, the youth programs often are designed without speaking to the youth, right? And, and, and so if they're going to be the farmers, then you have to go and figure out, well, what is it about them that's going to engage them in farming? Not what is it about farming that's going to engage the youth? And again, so all of our questions are backwards. We, we think, how can we make youth, how can we make farming sexy or something? Well, you know, that's making a whole lot of assumptions about what the youth want. So again, following Abdu'l-Baha's principle of start with the farmer, if you want these youth to be farmers, you have to start with the youth and, and have the discussion with them about, about farming, not, not bring farming to them, if you follow the difference. It's very subtle, it's very nuanced, and it's not easy because it's just a heck of a lot easier to plow and plant yourself and get the crop out 
than it is to raise, you know, but the same thing with raising children, isn't it? It's just, <laughs> it's very easy to make a baby, but raise it is a tough challenge, you know? So um, the issue of raising farmers is a long-term investment, which most governments don't want to sustain because they have to get reelected every five years. And, and then there's also the challenge of procurement based, like a lot of our policy our policies here are also procurement based. Yes. So like so like the last strategy I was talking about, um, the estimates cost is about it's going to be about three billion US dollars in the next five years. So it means some people are going to figure out where that money is going to come and sometimes it doesn't it doesn't reach the farmers. So these are some of the challenges which are there. So that's why the conversation and the perspective you're bringing is how how do we get the farmer's perspective from the beginning the other way around and not the way we do it thank you thank you all right um alberta sure thank you i really enjoyed this talk um and as others have said, even lots of similarities for us here in, in Canada um, between the challenges that you're, you're facing. I was laughing with the age of the farmer and transitioning to younger people. Like my husband's like, what is he saying? And I was like, well, basically the old people don't want, don't trust the, the youth. And I'm not a youth, but my dad doesn't really trust me um, in terms of transferring, like, I'm joking, uh, but it, it's a real challenge everywhere um, in agriculture. And so that's always interesting to see. I have one question for you and I'll ask it now. And then I had a few other comments. I was wondering if you can share more about the financial mechanism and like, if you have any examples of how that actually um, has been working, because you mentioned that it was like trust, trust-based and something that came out of the Baha'i community. That's what I heard, but maybe it, it was a bit um, wrong. Some of the other things that I was thinking about, um, because our reading group that I'm in this time, the speaker came and there is an underlying assumption about agriculture that it's like it's associated with poverty, right? And I think until we shift that narrative in everyone's minds, it is going to be a big challenge in attracting youth and attracting new people. Um, yeah, I just, I think it really is associated with that and it has that negative connotation and it's not something that we talk about um, very much at all. And I wonder how we can come through that. Um, I wanted to share, uh, what else? Yeah, here in Canada, like we also have state and national level gov level governments, and we're seeing city level governments come up with more policy that's related to urban agriculture, which I think is interesting, and that kind of gets closer to the farmer. But the federal government sets the overall policies, and definitely the farmer is not really part of that conversation. And I'd say we are maybe shifting here to where it's um, the policies are aimed at fixing, it, it's not even talking about the farms, it's about looking at challenges. So the challenge of food security and the challenge of labor. So in a way, it's like even removing the conversation further from the farmer itself um, when these policies are being developed. So uh, we'll see how that evolves. Okay. That's my question though. Those were some of my thoughts. Oh, and a resource for you guys. Um, Young Agrarians is a, just a really interesting organization that's popped up here and they have quite a bit of information on their website that I think is useful for people who are interested in agriculture and young farmers and those the challenges of accessing land. So just might be an interesting thing. Uh, program kind of to look at. But my question was about the financial mechanism and how that's worked on a practical level, if you have any specific examples. Uh, so so the, the financial aspects, so what we have in that community, it's called 
the community bank, uh, it's different from the, the commercial banks we know. So it's just uh, the members of the community uh, pull their resources together so that they they save. Actually, it's it's be it's a financial um, approach that has been adopted so much within the rural communities where uh, the people come together to make savings. Uh, in the past, people would like they would pull their resources; they would be saved. Then, at a later point during the year, uh, they share it out. But then, this uh, got um, modified in a way that all the financial resources are pulled together. Then, whoever wants to borrow from the community bank borrows. Actually, when the money is saved, so this. Um, there's an amount that uh, members within the community bank are supposed to contribute every every month. So when that contribution comes in, it's also, uh, it's most of it don't get saved because they also have a bank account at a commercial bank. But then after all the money have uh, come in and it's been counted and they've known how much they've re raised in a, in a, a specific month, then open up again to friends. So who wants to borrow money and how much? So depending on how many friends uh, show interest in borrowing, if there's enough amount to go around, then everyone will get all the, all the, the, the amount they asked for. But if it's not enough, then they, they figure out how to weight it and so everyone gets at least some amount of money. And so what happens when someone doesn't, you know, doesn't um, pay up? So these people often uh, time, they are also involved in other uh, income uh, activities and so, when we, we are involved with you in, in, a, in, in an activity, so I become, I guarantee you by the fact that we engage in this business together. So in case of failure, uh, my failure to pay, oftentimes uh, you'd be expected to, to cover up for, uh, for, my, for, the, for the amount that I haven't paid. Uh, however, because this only happened because the bank, the community bank, it's amongst people who, who, who chose to join the bank on their own. Oftentimes, it doesn't get to a point where someone else uh, has to be forced to, to pay in order to recover for the amount that someone else had borrowed. Because uh, so, and they are also lenient with one another. But the rural community getting access to financial uh, services uh, or facilities is not easy. So uh, if you're supposed to pay this month and you don't make up your payment, you'll still be given a lot more time to be able to, to make payments. And when you make production of crops and make sales, then you are, obligated, you are asked to, to remit some portion of whatever you make from the sales of your products, just to ensure that people continue getting uh, financial uh, access. Thank you. Um, Stephen. Well, this was very interesting, and, and uh, Alberto's question led me to think about a couple of things, several comments as well, and then your response. You know, one of the principles I think that we have within the faith is is that we we start uh, with, I guess, in our field, we would call it assets-based development. We start with what we have rather than uh, looking for things externally. And, you know, I mean, if you look at how all of our plans work, we're asked to look within and then see what we can do with what we've got rather than saying, oh, we need all these things to come to us before we can start. So we, we do this from a, a, an assets-based approach. 
which is also a question I had about, because I know in our country, uh, it, it, everything's done on a needs-based approach. So it's a deficit of planning. Uh, what, what, what problem do you have? What are your needs? And then we'll come and fill them, which sets up a power relationship between those that are asking the question and those that are answering them, automatically assuming that if you're asking me, you must have something that, <laughs> that I need. So I'll make my list longer, you know? Um, you know, so, so in, I know, again, in my classes, it was banned. We weren't allowed to do this. We were training extension workers. And they said, you, you may not ask the question, what do you need? You have to start with what, what, have you, what are you trying to do and what have you got? You know, and and just change the, the the direction, the dynamic of the narrative. So I was curious about that. Um, the the other thing is someone was talking about association. And it was Alberta saying it's, the agriculture is associated with poverty. It's very interesting you should say that because um, primary agriculture, production agriculture, is associated with poverty. Value adding agriculture is not. And and um, and so this has been one of the challenges in Africa. We are an extraction based economy. When the colonists came here, they extracted from us. Uh, they took our 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 uh, oil, our you know, raw materials, our gems, you know, ore, all that kind of stuff, minerals. Um, then they took our raw agricultural products, and all the value adding is done elsewhere. So all the money is made somewhere else. And what is so in interesting here in South Africa? Again, I was going to ask you there because I think you said there's very little value adding. Uh, we still work on an extraction-based economy where the goal is to get the farmer to produce the lowest, the highest quality uh, product at the lowest possible price. So we are extracting from him or her, uh, just as the Europeans and others did to extract from the continent, uh, we still use an extraction-based mentality in terms of our, our economic structure for agriculture. So for me, I was wondering if you've made any progress on that, because we have not. You know, I know I did some work on Lesotho where we got the, the um, mohair industry to change, and they now have value adding that farmers own. Because it's, it, part of the challenge is we've always talked about market access for farmers. And my argument is I would rather have market ownership, <laughs> not market access. Because access just means somebody else gets my product cheap and makes money off of me. Where if I own that, then if part of that market, then I can make money off of that as well. So again, it's these, it's these are are all inter interconnected pieces um, that I was just wondering, you know, how you guys approach it. Is agriculture, when you say the word agriculture, do you mean primary production, or do you include the value chain? Um, I, I was interested in Canada. I was there uh, some years ago, and they had developed in this town a a farmer to restaurant connection so that the farmers and the restaurants were part of each other. And they had cut out the people selling cheaply to the guy who would then sell more expensively to the restaurant. So this idea of owning part of that market strengthened the relationship between the producers and the final product, let's say sellers. Um, these are challenges because it has to do with, again, the nobility of the farmer recognizing his or her rights to be a part of the economy. He's the first active agent, recognizing that, that position and then building on it. So are these are just things I'm wondering if you guys discuss this at all, because I know we're trying to get this discussion here. Um, uh, and it's very tough because the extraction economy is very, very well embedded in our th thinking uh, in, in every aspect. We want to produce at the best quality at lowest price for someone else to buy and make money off of. And that has to change. In that aspect, uh, we are quite similar. But when we talk about agriculture here, we are talking about uh, production from the farm. Uh, however, the, the conversation is progressively moving towards uh, the value chain. How does it get to the market? How much? So, uh, even the farmers are now beginning to form associations uh, to try to get their produce to almost the end consumers um, directly from them. It works in some, it's, it's still at a very um, pilot stage. Like there've been a few startups which are now getting produces products from farmers and getting it to the end consumers 
direct. So they pro they give farmers better prices for their produce, and it's still relatively affordable to the end consumer. However, in major cities like Nairobi, where I live in, even if farmers had the material means to put their, let's say, cabbages, because we've been having drought, so any vegetable fetches a lot of money right now. They put it on a lorry and bring it to Nairobi. They still, uh, in the major markets, there are cartels, so they would not allow you to sell in that market. It's like the certain people on the market, so you you have to. They they tell you how much they are going to give you for a lorry a lorry load of you no know, produce, and if you don't, your your produce is going to go to waste. So these are some of the the challenges that also needs to be addressed. Because just like you've said, there's someone who is benefiting off the labor of the farmer unfairly, and the farmers cannot make much. And uh, it's it's been a, pro a problem. Even the government, we have a government or a statal called National Cereals Board. It's supposed to be buying maize from farmers. Because maize is one of the uh, one of the main uh, um, crop that we consume in this country, so to ensure that the stability of supply in the market. But after the harvest, instead of the farmer setting the price for you know for a bag of you know a ninety kg bag of maize, because that's the common unit of sales for maize, they set the price for how much they want to buy it from the farmer. So unlike in all other production where the producer determines how much the cost went into the production, then they put up you know, their margin for profit. This, are, this one works the other way around. So the farmers are still disadvantaged and it's these are some of the things that are not yet uh, you know, addressed fully. And, um, so there are also, you know, there are also other issues with uh, just the same way. There are also other issues that the farmers face. And I believe the fact that we've been having the, you know, the, ex, uh, the exploitation of the farmers and the extraction tendency, I mean, this also led the farmers to adopt very unsustainable practices trying to, you know, trying to unsustainably increase their production. And this is lowering the capacity of the land to produce and brings in other, other challenges that's, that we have environmental issues. So like farmers now expanding their production into wetlands, into forest, and this eventually gets to affect their production in the future. Thank you for that. Um, folks, we're getting close. We've kind of passed our time that we normally end, but we do have two more. I'll just take two more uh, questions or comments and then we'll we'll close. So uh, Winnie? Yes, I noticed that we're past our time, but we are really engaged in the critical <laughs> issues of all of this. And I especially appreciate uh, Stephen bringing up asset-based development because so often, I don't think that we come from there in many of our endeavors. So um, in thinking about land ownership, Holians, how does it work in Kenya? Do farmers own their land with deeds that they could then pass on to the younger generation if they trusted it? Uh, here in the United States, I know of one farmer who had several children, only one of them wanted to farm the land and it was extensive land and some of it was, uh, could be regenerated. But because that younger farmer did not um, farm like his father did, his father would not give that land to his son. And I wonder what are the, qualities, the assets of the older generation and being able to look at the young, is there, is there a way 
to encourage them to see the young uh, with a different eye and what the assets of the young are. Uh, but to begin with, how is land uh, transferred? Because in this country, our minority farmers uh, often don't make wills. And of course, in the Baha'i faith, we know that we need to make a will. And so uh, there are many, the, the farmer dies, no will. Many people are the heirs. It goes to court and nobody has enough money to buy the farm, even if they want it. And someone with the money gets it. So uh, we, we have um, two types of a uh, land tenure system. So we will have, um, we have individual ownership, which is uh, outright, then we have communal. So usually for the communal uh, land ownership, the land people have user access. And then with the, we, when you, with, with the individual ownership, so it's able, you are, it's easily transferable. And um, so the person who owns the land can decide who they, they hand over the piece of land. And this has had also its challenges because um, it has also, it's what has also resulted into the unsustainable subdivisions of land. Like, so a male usually, in this country, land is owned by the male member of the family. So a father then divides the land to his sons, who later on do subdivides the, their piece to their grandsons. So that's what that's how we have ended up with, you know, with very tiny pieces of land which sometimes are un unproductive. So at some point there's been a conversation of how do we go back to consolidate the, the, you know, the land units in a way that they become more productive. And how do we move the the population around? Because it's a small piece of land where someone, where people live in. So these are all challenges which are there, but when it comes to the transfer of land, it's quite easy, even without a will. In cases where family members know that so-and-so had a son, and he passes on even if there's not a will, their family members would stand up and say, this is the rightful heir, and then the land would be passed on. So, but uh, because of materialism, when that happens, there have also been cases where some people know that you're supposed to be inherit the land and you didn't know of its existence, then some other people will you know, claim it, but it's, it's not that bad. Okay, uh, Neil? Dear Holly Ons, I could listen to you forever. I think you speak so clearly and so slowly and so it's really wonderful. The word that came to me though is justice. That all the topics, once we look at them through this lens of justice, we see how unfair agriculture has become. Perhaps it was always like that, but I think this, just to, to respond to Stephen's you know, extensive comments, the one thing the, the Baha'i faith does stand for is equality and justice. And I think it's going to take this transformation of the world is going to, you know, it's going to take many, many generations and centuries. But I think always we've got to look, are we treating the, the workers fairly? Are we treating the land fairly? And this kind of thing. So I just wanted to share this, this fundamental concept of justice that is fundamental to the faith. And once the assemblies and the houses of justice, once their opinion is, is going to be respected in the community, they are going to sure, ensure that every that there is a principle of fairness right up the value chain.
audience, you're muted. Did you want to say something? Yes. I just want, I, um, uh, I was saying that Neil is right about justice and fairness because that's that's what we really need to to strive towards achieving because it's, it's quite interesting that we are all eating and food is one of we cannot live without food but the main producers of food like in africa especially people who are producing cash crops they are quite, they're quite food insecure because they are producing coffee for sale, you know, for export. And they're producing cacao like in Ghana for export. And so so they they produce and they, they, they are sold at quite low prices. And they don't have you know food to subsist on. So the amount they make from the sale of the cash crops cannot, you know, improve their their livelihoods cannot transform their lives, but that's that's the reality in this world that we are in, and we we have to you know figure out how to move from it. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, I see Joe has his hand up. We wanna we wanna kind of move along here. If you just have a very brief comment, because it's very late for uh, for Holyans, isn't it? <laughs> I wasn't going to talk at all, but I'm listening okay. here and I'm thinking that okay. I'm not a, I, I'm a city boy and I'm involved with civic agriculture, but not farming necessarily. Seems like there is a big distinction between cash crops that pay off national debts and feeding children. That's one issue. The second one is, and, and this is probably part of the heritage of Western Europeaners taking over the world, is looking at land as a ownership in terms of ownership as a commodity yep. instead of trusteeship yeah and the other one is looking at food as a commodity instead of a human right right yeah thank you joe thank you and thank you everyone for coming i want to thank holy aunt's wonderful presentation very very heartfelt very beautiful Thank you so much. So thank you, everyone. Good to see everyone. Thank you, Holy Hands. Yes. Yes. Thanks for all the good thoughts. Yeah. Bye bye. We're very proud of you, Holy Hands. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and thank you, Dawn, for good facilitation. We appreciate it. Well, <laughs> my pleasure. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, Don. Thank you. Good night, Holly. Good night. <laughs>